and um, good to see you, Shia, as always. Yeah. You notice Love I changed my background for the last uh, of these uh, talks. And it's one of our favorite uh, Shibiti amulets, of course, so very Absolutely. appropriate for today. <laughs> we started our conversations in, uh, in, uh, in uh, August uh, talking about amulets, so I figured I would bring amulets. We still need protection. As, as, as we started the webinar, a, a Bay Area advisory just came in through my uh, through my phone saying that we are now effectively and it's under stay at home order. So uh, it's uh, it's what it is, but welcome everybody and uh, to zooming in the weekly curatorial conversations uh, of the magnets with Francesco that's me and with Shir Galkochavi. Thank you Shir, for me. joining every week. These are conversations are, or are organized by the Magnus collection of Jewish art and life and presented by UC Berkeley's College of Letter and Science. Division of Arts and Humanities are parts of the Arts and Ideas live online series, which started in the spring as we were all jumping into shelter in place and dealing with the pandemic. Uh, we all pooled resources together to, to present content that we would normally present in person. And in the case of the Magnus, as it's museum, and we see in the background of Shir's uh, uh, Zoom uh, uh, window, we, we see our galleries, our beloved gallery. In view of galleries and, and programs, we are presenting weekly. And every week we center a presentation on an object or an object type on an idea and we explore together week after week after object after object we explore uh, the incredible holdings of the magnus collection of jewish art and life which is one of the largest in the world third largest in north america and the only one in the world of this magnitude at the same point that's part of a uh, public research university so uh, a lot of what we bring every week is uh, the result of our teaching research uh, work with students with faculty and of course our own uh, curatorial uh, work um, just a couple of uh, um, orders of business uh, this is a zoom webinar which means that uh, participants video are not on so we do not see the participants but you can uh, ask technical questions and also uh, through the chat. And you can also from home, you can let us know where you're zooming in from. We always like to know where people are, are joining us from. And instead, if you're interested in, in asking questions, so we, we're roughly will present for about 20 minutes or so, 20, 20 few minutes. And, and, and at the end, if you want to, or during the presentation, want to ask questions, you go to the bottom of your screen and a zoom control window and there is a a nice little button called Q&A. You can use it to ask questions and we'll do our very best to answer them uh, when we're done uh, presenting our topic today. You can always research magnus at berkeley.edu is the email and magnus.berkeley.edu is uh, the website. Through the website, you can also access, we'll remind you at the end of this presentation, you can also access our YouTube channel where all of these presentations, these weekly presentations, so roughly 30 minutes of video a week, are being archived and are accessible at any time. So uh, there's a way if you, if you missed uh, one of the episodes of our saga of Zooming in, you can go back to the, to the website and go to YouTube and, and you, you can find us there. Uh, we're not going too far uh, altogether. Uh, this week we're talking about, we're sort of continuing uh, and we're presenting last week and this week in collaboration with, uh, with the six Bay Area Jewish Community Centers that helped us promote uh, this, uh, this week and last week our Hanukkah uh, talk. So bringing, ideally bringing the light uh, to you from the over 200, roughly 250 Hanukkah lamps from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. It's by far not, not one of the largest collections of uh, Hanukkah lamps, but it's uh, sizable. And as we, we, are, we were able to see last week, very diverse with uh, materials from all over the world. And uh, last week, we kind of focused on the idea of what we learned from the shape of Hanukkah lamps. And we kind of zeroed in on the idea that Hanukkah lamps represent identity, whether it's individual, collective, family identity, communal identity, and so on. And this week, we're kind of focusing on, on one subset of that with this uh, really, uh, well, in a way, unique uh, Hanukkah lamp that's at the Magnus, and it was brought to the Magnus. We'll explore this story. Uh, and was collected in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Germany in, uh, in the 1940s by a military chaplain, a rabbi in the US Army and brought to San Francisco and donated it to the Magnus. Um, and it was produced in a workshop for displaced persons in Germany in 19, around 1945, 46. Um, so we are going to explore what this lamp is about, but uh, to, to start with that, uh, 
We'll, we'll discuss issues of self-empowerment as they're represented in Hanukkah lamps. We're going to trace survivors' roots and understand how a lamp like this could be made by, survive, by Holocaust survivors in the aftermath of World War II. And more broadly, and to conclude our series, uh, discuss the, through this lamp uh, the fact that these objects are actually historical sources. So we can use them to really understand a lot about our collective historical past. Um, Self-empowerment is a topic shared that we, we discussed uh, uh, last week already. So we're just quickly reviewing this is our lamp and it is a form of self-empowerment. We'll discuss how and, and, and why. And, uh, but there is a long tradition to, to, to of course. Lamp, lamps as a form of self-empowerment. And one of them is that the hero of Hanukkah in the early modern period and also of Hanukkah lamps was Yehudit or Judith. Uh, who uh, in, in the biblical story, in the book of Judges, uh, cuts the head of all the furnace. And Shira, I see you kind of uh, frozen a little bit. So I don't know if you're with us, you know, technical issues can, have, yeah, you're here. So uh, what, what uh, on, the, on the left, we have a, 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 a just a part of a Hanukkah lamp that depicts you did holding all the furnaces head. And definitely the, um, the painting by Artemisia Gentileschi is not as a Magnus. <laughs> Uh, but that's what the iconography, the classical iconography is about. And it's interesting that he made it into, into, into Hanukkah lamps. What does the inscription say? We, we do see yes. uh, Judith and holding a sword and holding the head of, uh, of Holofernes yes. and mustache. Holofernes. And of course, um, the text say? around it in Hebrew says, Minashim be'oel Yehudit tevorach, eshet lapidot blimora, which translates to, Judith is blessed among women, a valiant woman without cowardice, which are references to the book of Judges and to the book of Joshua. And the reference, of course, to Yael and to, to the characters of Yael and Deborah. And of course, we kind of ended in, on this note last week, but we should mention that um, the seventh uh, candle of Hanukkah, just a couple of nights ago, is actually the evening and the, and the celebration uh, that, is, uh, that was traditionally so celebrated by the Jewish communities of North Africa, that was called Il, Id El Banat, which is Fet de Fila, or the celebration of the women. And it was uh, traditionally, um, it says that the holiday uh, derives from actual, from actual biblical times. And it's a celebration of, of women and female power and empowerment, which means that they were actually celebrating these characters, exactly Judith, um, Devora, Yael, Hannah, and other characters, other, and of course, Estelle, and the female characters of the Bible who saved the Jewish people. So, uh, so a nice way to. And, to end and it. last week we saw, thank you, Shir. Last week we saw how uh, Hanukkah lamps, uh, these are not from the Magnus collection, where, whereas the Jewish Museum in New York on the left uh, and the Israel Museum on, on the right do depict and embody uh, mm -hmm. uh, Yehudit Judith and uh, in her mighty force, but we also discussed how by the uh, late 19th, especially early 20th century and with the rise of Zionism, the, the focus shift more to uh, male heroes on the story and especially the Maccabees. And we see from the early 20th century to the late 20th century, and oh, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna use my pointer here mm -hmm. uh, if I can, but uh, we see the, the scene depicted of the rekindling of the, of the menorah of the seven branch candelabra in the, in the temple, but we see that uh, there is a whole scene that involves uh, the Maccabees. And, and finally in this Ori Sherman's on the right, so, so late 20th century, uh, incredible depiction of a very rich and very exegetical depiction of, of, the, of the traditions around uh, Hanukkah, we see that uh, holding the sword, not the head of the enemy, is a male character. Mm -hmm. uh, so really the narrative shifted uh, but altogether, it is a narrative of self-empowerment, sometimes imagined more than real. Uh, and um, we were discussing how actually many of the revolts that are echoed from the ancient past that were failed revolts in a way or another. Uh, but uh, so it's more sometimes more of an imaginary uh, self-empowerment, but self-empowerment nonetheless. And um, also we talk about how uh, specifically this week, how a, a Hanukkah lamp uh, this it helps us discuss the issue of self-empowerment on the part of survivors. Uh, just this morning, I read a blog post from our colleague from the uh, Met, 
uh, the Med Coisters, uh, who uh, published a beautiful uh, short entry on this uh, Hanukkah lamp we see on the left. This is from the Moldovan family co collection. It's a very, very important private collection in New York on loan uh, to the Mets and displayed on Hanukkah at the Met uh, since uh, 2014 every year. And um, they've done research and it's research very similar to ours. So they found this is at, at the center is a photo from the Holocaust Museum in, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, an American tourist from the city of Lviv or Lvov or Lemberg, depending which language, uh, Poland at the time, Austro-Hungarian, then Poland, and, and now in Ukraine. It's a long story. We're not going to explain it today. But a photo from 1921 where a, a, a returning uh, Jewish man from, 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 from the United States, an immigrant uh, from Poland, had, went, had gone back to Lviv and took this photo of the synagogue where we see uh, traces of the, of the Hanukkah lamp uh, at the time. And, but I was really struck by our colleagues, uh, Barbara Drakebone's words, uh, in the face of such unconscionable human loss, the entire, basically the entire Jewish community of, of Lviv was wiped out very quickly and very efficiently by the Nazis. Um, in the face of such unconscionable human loss, is it right to speak of survival when what has been saved are inanimate objects? Can a precious object somehow call out on behalf of the lost ones who created them, polished them, lit them, prayed by them, and sometimes, as we know, with them, because many of these objects are used to pray with, not just to pray by. And uh, in our case this week, uh, I would say we're really, really talking about uh, survival and survival both of individuals and embodiment and representations of survival through a Hanukkah lamp. Uh, what we're going to investigate uh, through the expert uh, guide of Shear in just a few seconds is the origins of this iconography, the lamp. So it has the eight candles of Hanukkah. The ninth candle on uh, here is, is uh, the sprouting branch of a broken log. And this is a very interesting and important symbol. And as we will learn of the uh, first organization of Holocaust survivors. So it's a story that throughout this lamp goes from the United States to Germany, to Palestine and back into all kinds of revolutions. So it's a, it's a fascinating story, uh, but this is a symbol of an organization or an organization that focused on self-empowerment of survivors, Holocaust survivors who are stuck in displaced persons camps, no, not able to go back or forward in their lives. And many of them immigrate to the United States, immigrate to Palestine or in 1948, the state of Israel. And, uh, and this is really an ex exemplification of, of how a Hanukkah lamp can be deployed to embody survival. So let's discover the story of this organization here and we can trace survivors roots yes, with you. we can do that together. Thank you, Francesca. So as Francesca beautifully explained, this is um, our lamp and of course the, the broken log and the sprouting leaf um, is actually the symbol used by the organization called Sherito Plita or the surviving remnant, which is, which is actually, uh, uh, which are words that are used in, in several times in the Bible, in the book of Ezra and also in the book of, Chron the first book of Chronicles. Um, and this is the name of an organization that was formed by Jewish by Holocaust uh, survivors in the in displaced camp, displaced persons camp in South Germany in 1945 that continued on uh, assisting survivors and representing them until 1950 or the beginning of 1951. Um, and here you see to your left an, an example of the, the opening ceremony of their third uh, annual conference. And on, of course, in the background there, where Francesco marked so beautifully is the, the broken log and the sprouting leaf. And right behind it is, of course, the, um, the map of Palestine, Israel. In the center of it, it's hard to see, but it's actually the city of Jerusalem. And to your right on the bottom of the screen is the program of that conference, where you can see even more beautifully how it was depicted. So the representation, of course, is taken from the two-dimensional depiction into the three-dimensional Hanukkah lamp. And, and this Hanukkah lamp was created by the, by the, the displaced persons in the camp uh, as, vocational, um, as part of vocational work that was uh, in schooling that was done in the camp in a, in a ceramics workshop, which is one of several workshops that were held in, within the, this camp and several other uh, displaced persons camp 
across Europe and, of course, Italy. And um, Francesco, if you don't mind going, yeah. scrolling down. I just wanted, before we skip to the next slide, I just wanted to point out that all of the text here is actually in Yiddish. It's Hebrew characters, but it's in Yiddish. Congress. That Congress. Mm -hmm. it's, and and uh, in other words, the, the lingua franca of survivors in Europe at that time was Yiddish, but of course there was English, there was Hebrew. Uh, it was a multilingual environment. And these workshops were mm -hmm. animated for not small part by the Joint American Joint Distribution Committee, which had an important role in providing reliefs to survivors. These were people who had been held captive, prisoners, enslaved, or in hiding. Uh, young children who had been in hiding, no, no access to schools, not, there was no Zoom, no remote uh, learning available, of course. And so it was really, the, the, these workshops were a way to, to help people return to life. So really the, 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 the term survival mm -hmm. is, is quite apropos. And here are these photos that you found for us here. Mm -hmm. So indeed the, the organization within the camps and a lot of them a lot of the setup of the vocational work and not only also the medical assistance, et cetera, was actually organized by the Jewish Joint Distribution, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. And for and therefore we actually went back and used their archives here to show you a few images of these vocational workshops for and bring you a few examples to show you that it wasn't only ceramics workshops and Judaica was clearly not the only thing being made. Um, so survivors learned how to repair and watch, how to repair uh, repair radios and also there are several other groups that um, that were educated in, in other in other types of materials and whether it was from cooking to to medical aid to whatever you can think of and of course libraries were also established and uh, and books were brought and this is actually a wonderful example from our collection from the couple Pinson um, photograph books. Um, we have two of these beautiful scrapbooks uh, put together by Cobble Pinson, a Jewish historian who went back and assisted the U.S. Army and worked with the American, Joint, American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee providing educational relief within these D, uh, DP camps and assisted while documenting the everyday life within these camps, whether it was the commemoration ceremonies um, of the Holocaust that were already taking place there or the cultural and Zionist activities, uh, we're lucky to have these photo albums within our collection. And we and presented are... about these a uh, few weeks yes. ago, a couple months ago, together with Just a colleague a from ago, campus, uh, Carla Chapro. Yes, so please it. feel free to go back to that talk and listen to us uh, going really in depth into these and looking through these albums and the work of Koppel Pinson uh, in Germany. Uh, but of course, then Koppel Pinson put it beautifully in his writing uh, when he explained we try to explain these uh, people, you know, that were brought together, that were forced together in these deportation camps and how they were able to, to survive. And in his words, uh, a conception of yichud, unity in Hebrew, has been developed among the people. This conception of unity holds that in their struggle for survival, all ideological differences formerly exi uh, existing in Jewish life were completely subord subordinated to, collect to collective unity which means that the unity and the coming together and the overcoming and the survival was really put on above uh, every difference uh, in every other struggle of, uh, of daily life. And that's how he, he experienced it when he was working with, with people in these camps. But of course that wasn't it and that wasn't the only journey. And Sherita Brita Apita, it's important to mention, was a Zionist organization. And many of its members uh, wanted to, to um, to go to Palestine, to immigrate to Palestine. But of course, Palestine at the time was part of the British uh, mandatory system. And, um, and the British had a different uh, point of view on the amount of immigrants that were, uh, that Israel was, that Palestine was, was uh, able to, to accept at the time. And between uh, 1945 and 1948, groups of um, well, but they were called makilim, they were called illegal Jewish immigrants, tried to travel and, and immigrate to Israel illegally without certifications. Uh, over 50,000 of them were uh, detained in British uh, detention camps that were established in Cyprus. And these are a couple of examples from these detention camps, mostly of young Zionists. Um, and as like many other similar camps, unfortunately, these were surrounded by barbed wire and of course, uh, watchtowers and here another beautiful example from our collection 
and there's a jewelry box created in one of these vocational workshops in uh, Cyprus, in one of the DP camps in Cyprus, where you can see um, the engravings of the barbed wire and the watchtower. And, but not only, but this, this was not of course only negative. We have to see the positive and we have to see, to really point out that the idea of survival and the life, the life that comes out of, of course, of the devastation. And this is a wonderful example of a ketubah from our collection from Cyprus from April, 1948. So of course, a Jewish yeah, marriage so of course, you know, life continues and marriages are taking place and birth and babies are being born and, and you know, the new generation is being brought into the world. Um, lucky for us. <laughs> and we, we have a, just a few seconds of a, of a video from that camp. Just to give a, give like a, a sense of who the people were who are producing uh, materials like the Hanukkah lamp we're discussing today. Where did you find this? Uh, this is a video that was here. put together by, uh, by uh, well, now it's organized by Pate, which is a European Association of uh, Film. And this is archi these are archival sources that were taken by the British, by members of the British um, mandate who were in charge of that specific camp. And this video actually is longer than what we're showing you, actually shows these uh, this group of, uh, of Jewish survivors, Jewish uh, immigrants who are uh, leaving the camp and at the end of this video, of this few minutes video, they managed to get to Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, in the collection, we also have other depictions of the blockade of entry to Palestine and the conundrum in which survivors found themselves at the end of World War II. This is a, a cartoon by Arthur Schick from the Toby family Arthur Schick collection at the Magnus uh, showing uh, what what Schick himself called the Jewish plot to survive, and uh, basically the, the 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 British Empire is is uh, scheming to keep Jewish refugees uh, away through an embargo away from from Palestine. Just to remind ourselves that uh, you know at the Magnus, and we 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 don't say this is a, a large collection and important collection for nothing. Is we can connect elements and objects and and visual culture and and, and more. Through, through our holdings and of course connect them with other holdings and other collections around, around the world. But let's uh, kind of zoom in exactly. and this is for our last weekly zooming in presentation uh, on, on, on the research that was done specifically on the lamp at the Magnus. This, this is a photo I took when I found myself researching this lamp some, some years ago. It was part of a, of a working group I put together with students and faculty. It was, uh, so we, we, we focused on this lamp a lot and research it from various points of view. And uh, realizing that other lamps were made in the same workshop with the same mold, but with different inscriptions. So we have here at the, on the right, the lamp from the Magnus. So this was my working table in the, in the Magnus uh, collection study room. And, 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 on my, uh, and on my laptop, I had a, an image of another lamp that's uh, held at the, at the Avashim in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem and has a different inscription and we'll go over that. And then another one, which is part of a private collection was published in a, in a catalog of the, of the, of a Jewish museum in, uh, in Germany, the museum, Jewish museum in, in Munich, in Germany. So remained locally in the area that most of the DP camp where the, the Magnus lamp, where these lamps were too, were, were in the, in the, in, in Southern Germany. Uh, so same mold, same, uh, embodiment of, of uh, self-empowerment, but different inscriptions that actually acknowledge the different individuals and organizations that were cooperating with, uh, with survivors and, uh, and uh, making their new life somewhat uh, possible at the time. And here they are in more, in more detail, the Magnus on the right, the Yad Vashem on the left. And this one uh, is inscribed here, yes, help, help us out with the Hebrew, top. right? Um. BT is actually a representation of the initials of the name of the person who was leading the ceramic workshop at the camp. His name was Benash Tash. And he was the one who donated it personally to, the, to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Um, and then of course, underneath it, we have Havad Merkazi Bemunchem, the Central Committee of Munich, which is a central uh, Holocaust survivors committee that was established in 1945. And underneath it, we have the year 1948. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the one at the Magnus just has the word joint referencing the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee that we discussed many 
kinds, and we'll continue to discuss among other things because the, the Roman Vishnu archive, which is at the Magnus, includes very important photographs of Jewish life in Central Eastern Europe before the war, before World War II. They were taken by Roman Vishnu and commissioned by the, the Joint Distribution Committee. Of so it's an important institution for the Magnus, for the holdings of the Magnus, and of course, in general. Um, the workshop produced other objects. And so here on the left, we have a, a from the collection of Jewish Museum in New York, a, a Passover Seder plate with all of the, um, the holdings for the various uh, foods on the, on the Seder plate. And this plate was then, and this is a copy on the right at the Magnus was, uh, it had its own revival. So it was reprinted, recreated in 1984 um, as a memento of, uh, of uh, Jewish life in, in the DP camps. And also of course, of the role of the Jewish, role of the Jewish uh, Joint Distribution Committee uh, in, uh, in, uh, in history. And, but other uh, objects were made with molds that were found in the, in the camp itself, which just as a, as a reminder, Fernwald was originally a factory that made these types of objects. So we see on the right, uh, various examples of ashtrays, uh, uh, beer mugs, anything with the same material. So they, they had molds and they produced them serially for different right. companies, exactly. different mm -hmm. businesses, etc. And, uh, and, uh, and then the, the factory became a, an enslaved labor uh, uh, camp during, during the Holocaust. And then it displaced persons camp after World War II. Uh, but they were using the same materials and the same molds. And in this case, they made an ashtray with, again, the symbol of the organization of uh, uh, survivors, Shreita Flita. So we see the broken log and the sprout, this time not no longer a Hanukkah lamp, just the symbol itself. And uh, uh, our resident Hebrew reader uh, here, I mean, this is Limrota Kol Israel Chai. I'm pronouncing Hebrew with my Italian yes. accent. I'm pretty <laughs> proud of that. Uh, and if you Very want nice. to translate for us. Yes, so Lamrata calls Chai, despite it all, Israel lives. And just to mention on the Seder plate, it also had the, what we traditionally uh, say, Mavdut Lecherut, from slavery to freedom, and this year in Jerusalem, Shana Zot Yerushalayim, which is how we usually tend to end, or next yeah. year in Jerusalem. Well, we, 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 the Seder tends to end yes. with next year in mm -hmm. Jerusalem, in this case, it's this, this year. year. And so it's really a, a, a different type of mm -hmm. uh, approach to, to, to future and present and to history. Uh, and here is our lamp. And uh, with all of its components and its histories and its visual elements and practical elements and materials and all of the details that we cherish so much. And we've been trying to share week after week uh, since the end of August with everybody who's following us uh, from home, hundreds of people that have been following us from home every week. Also, how we study the Magnus Collection, how we encourage the Magnus Collection to be interpreted by others, what we learn from our students, what we learn from our colleagues on the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, so we, we just wanted to share treasures, interesting materials, but also a few ideas mm -hmm. along, along the way. 16 weeks, we presented every week, except for uh, Thanksgiving Rosh and, and, uh, and, and Rosh Hashanah, and that was it. And we'll be back. We'll we'll announce the schedule. We'll 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 provide more content in the spring. Uh, Shir, you have a way to yes, access the Q and A. I do not. Questions. And again, I want to remind everybody that they can use Q and A to to reach us. And we just have a couple more minutes before we end the broadcast. And um, we don't have a, a next uh, uh, zooming in to announce. We'll take a couple of weeks off and before we come back to work. The camp closing for the winter break, but uh, we'll be back in January and continue to, to produce content for everyone. Uh, can you share what the, what the questions yes, are here? Because I let's just quickly them. go through a couple of the questions and thank you all again for your wonderful questions and for listening to us and joining us. Uh, the first- You know what I can do, something uh, radical. I can stop sharing and show yes, myself in my so full here video. we are. Um, the first question yeah. is, uh, were there workshop gender specific? Uh, that you know, girl could could a girl or woman learn to repair a radio? Um, from what I understood, um, most of the workshops were actually gender specific, um, and uh, you see it a lot in the photographs, and you see it a lot in the in the documentation. Um, I I wasn't able to find a diary or any reference of a survivor saying something different, so I will 
gladly uh, invite all of you to research this. And if anybody has more information, please share it with us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And can we talk about the role of ORT in the vocation? We, <laughs> we could, but it's not really the focus of our, our talk. Maybe some other, some other talk uh, can be devoted to that, but definitely. Uh, there were many organizations, many institutions, and individuals that were doing everything they could to help survivors and to re-engineer their life, uh, their future life, their return to life. Uh, and all of it was actually documented by Roman Vishniak, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back to that and show you a little bit more of that absolutely. in the future. And there is a very, very good question about what the, what the clay body of the lamp is. So what we will do is we will post on our, on our Facebook so we invite the person who's asking to follow us on our Facebook, a talk that our colleague from uh, the Department of Art Practice, uh, Gregory Niemeyer, uh, presented uh, a couple of years ago at the Magnus. We have it on YouTube, so it will be a YouTube link. And he discussed specifically the materials of this lamp and, and what we learned from them. So we're gonna leave that to, to uh, and and somebody's asking if they can email we can email them with a new schedule is ready do we have do we have to keep checking so we will definitely send an e-blast and and for those of you who want to uh, who are not on a mailing list they can go to on the magnus website and and click on join the mailing list and uh, and we they will be added to our uh, usually monthly so we promise it will not be too many emails from from us announcing what our programs are and what we do as we plan in the spring we'll be planning for for exhibitions for next year because we do hope to get out of this pandemic at some yes. point and to, yeah, be able to see to each other see one another <laughs> person and, and, to and, visit the person and, and present exhibitions on site a tangible culture um uh when and under what circumstances are hanukkah lamps allowed to have representational images any circumstance we discussed this last week so again go to you to find our talk uh, there are all kinds of uh, reasons why uh, why lamps have shapes, and we kind of hinted at, at those reasons. So hopefully, we answered last week, and 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 viewers can go back to YouTube and find our archive uh, talks. And I think with this, we want to also extend our thanks yes. to Ross mm -hmm. Coulter, uh, an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, uh, who is uh, who has joined us for the for several weeks and helped us facilitate these talks, these behind the scenes, and answering your your chat. Uh, questions. Uh, so he's not on screen, but he's very much with us and part of the team. And so is the rest of the Magnus team from um, faculty director Ben Brenner to everyone in, in the collections team and our manager. And we're really grateful to all of them for making these talks possible week after week. And thank you, Shir, thank you for, <laughs> for bringing your your joy. And here is Ross from uh, from the back of the- With the, the last session thank you for wrapping up, I Excellent. might as well show yes. my face. Yes. I, I wanted to ask Lovely. you, but I also didn't want to put you on the spot. So no, no, it's the to. it's the last day of finals. So, uh, Ross, you may need to go and and finish things up. But we are lucky so time. great. Luckily, I'm all to... done, uh, just in time to uh, be here and help you all out. It was a pleasure, yeah. as always. I look forward to continuing this in the spring as well. Absolutely, and so are we. Take care, everyone, and take care, everyone from home. And uh, we'll we'll be back, and we'll announce in time when we're back. Thanks again. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.